a guide to growing arugula. Also commonly known as racket, English, roquette, French, or rucola, Italian, arugula is a leafy green with a tart, bitter, peppery taste. It originated in the Mediterranean, but now it's enjoyed everywhere. It makes for a great salad green and is a yummy addition to many cooked dishes. Arugula Varieties There are two general types of arugula, wild Italian arugula and common arugula. Within these categories, there are a few different varieties to choose from. Astro This variety produces leaves that are rounded at the top and lobed toward the bottom. It typically matures in 38 days, and it has a milder flavor than other varieties. Silvetta This wild variety grows slower than most, taking 35 days to be harvested as baby arugula and 50 days to reach maturity. It's deeply lobed with a stronger flavor and has slightly yellow veins. It produces a yellow flower that can also be eaten. Dragon Tongue This type has deeply lobed leaves with red veins. Dragon tongue doesn't have a bitter taste, even when it's mature. Wasabi Smaller in size and shaped like a spoon, these green leaves have a strong flavor that resembles horseradish or wasabi, hence its name. This variety is known to bolt quickly and takes about 45 days to reach maturity. Belizea This variety is darker green in color with white to light yellow veins. It's deeply lobed and grows straighter than other varieties, making it nice to harvest. Like Silvetta, it's slow growing, taking 51 days to reach maturity and 35 to be ready for harvest as baby arugula. Bonus, this variety resists downy mildew. Though it can be transplanted, arugula is most successful when directly sown. The ideal soil temperature for arugula to germinate is between 40 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Arugula's minimum air temperature tolerance is 28 degrees Fahrenheit, while its maximum tolerance is 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Established plants can actually withstand frost. Arugula should be grown in soil that can retain moisture, has good drainage, and has a fairly neutral pH, between 6 and 7 is best. This crop requires full sun and cool temperatures, but when growing in warm temperatures, it will need some shade, just like us. Before planting arugula, prepare the garden bed. To do so, find a good spot with rich, well-draining soil in full sun, though partial shade works too. Loosen the top eight inches, 20 centimeters or so of soil. Then mix in some compost and an organic fertilizer containing nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Once this is done, level out the top with a rake. When sowing arugula seeds, keep them two inches, five centimeters apart, in rows that are about four inches, 10 centimeters apart. These seeds should be planted at a depth of a quarter to a half inch, with just a thin layer of soil covering them. Arugula is fast growing, so it needs a lot of water. Directly after sowing or transplanting, give the plants a nice drink. Then keep the soil moist throughout the growing period. Water arugula in the morning, because this gives the water some time to soak into the soil without evaporating too quickly. Also, Thin the seedlings just so they can reach that ideal spacing of two inches apart in rows that are four inches apart. As well as thinning, weeding is another important process when caring for arugula. These plants should be weeded frequently because this limits competition, lowers the risk of pests, and makes harvesting a lot easier. To protect arugula from pests, plants can be covered with insect netting after planting. Properly secure all the edges to reduce the risk of insect attacks. Use a complete natural fertilizer, one that has nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium when preparing the garden bed for planting or transplanting. Arugula has a short growth period though, so fertilizer won't need to be reapplied. 
As well, arugula is a crop that grows quite densely, so it doesn't need mulching. Transplanting Best Practices Directly sowing of arugula seed is best, either in a garden bed, raised bed, or in containers. Arugula doesn't typically transplant well, and it's a time-consuming process for how dense arugula is planted. However, transplanting is still possible. Here are some steps to keep in mind. Step 1. Start seedlings indoors about 4 to 6 weeks before the last frost. Most arugula varieties are, in fact, frost tolerant. Step 2. Plant seeds indoors in trays, with three seeds per cell to ensure high germination success. Then, thin to just one plant per cell before transplanting, keeping only the healthiest seedlings. Step 3. Grow arugula seedlings on a sunny window and keep their soil moist. Step 4. Transplant arugula about eight weeks after sowing indoors, keeping in mind their preferred soil and air temperature conditions. Step 5. Amend the soil the same as for direct sowing, using compost and fertilizer. Step 6. Space the plants 2 inches 5 centimeters apart, in close rows that are 4 inches 10 centimeters apart. Arugula can be grown with carrots, cucumbers, and bush beans to conserve garden space. Bush beans also fix nitrogen in the soil and offer some added nutrition. Lettuce is another great companion because it shades arugula while keeping the soil cool and moist. Arugula can be grown in the ground, in a planter pot, or in a raised bed, as long as they have a minimum soil depth of eight inches, 20 centimeters. Aphids. These tiny pests come in a variety of colors, green, black, red, light orange, or yellow, and mainly feed on the undersides of leaves and stems. What they're actually feeding on is the sap in plants, which ends up causing the plants damage. Aphids also leave behind a sticky substance called honeydew, and they are a pest that's known to spread diseases. Aphids can be tolerated by most plants when their numbers are low, but if there's a lot of aphids, they can stunt a plant's growth and cause a plant's leaves to turn yellow and fall off. Here's what to do. For the most part, plants can handle mild aphid infestations, but if they're found, a strong jet of water from a garden hose will wash them off the plants. Spraying plants with water should be done early in the morning so that the plants can dry off during the day. Sticky traps, neem oil, insecticidal soaps, and horticultural oils are also effective against aphids. Just be sure to follow the application instructions on the packaging. Oftentimes, you can also get rid of aphids by wiping or spraying the leaves with a mild solution of water and a few drops of dish soap. One variation includes adding a pinch of cayenne pepper Soapy water should be reapplied every two to three days, or about two weeks. As well, you can try to attract beneficial insects, like lady beetles, hoverflies, and lacewings, all of which are important aphid predators. Make sure to check all transplants for aphids before planting. And keep in mind that aphids aren't very mobile, so it's not uncommon to find one heavily affected plant surrounded by plants that are fine. If this is the case, Simply remove and destroy the infected plant. Flea beetles. Small beetles that are either black, a blue color, bronze, gray, or sometimes striped. Flea beetles jump when they're disturbed, and they also shimmer in the light. Flea beetles feed on leaves and seedlings, and the damage from their feeding habits can stunt a plant's growth reduce yields, spread diseases, or kill seedlings off entirely. Young plants are especially vulnerable, while older plants can survive an infestation much better. Here's what to do. Use a lightweight floating row cover at the beginning of the season to prevent flea beetles from becoming an issue. 
There's also a homemade spray that uses two cups of rubbing alcohol, five cups of water, and one tablespoon of liquid soap that can work to repel these bugs. Test out this mixture on a single leaf first. Let it sit overnight, then spray the rest of the plant if there aren't any side effects. Dusting plants with plain talcum powder can also help, as well as using white sticky traps to capture these pests as they jump. As well, weeds attract and shelter flea beetles, so it's important to keep weed growth under control. Insecticides might help for about a week, but they'll need to be reapplied, and adding a layer of mulch is yet another option. Be sure to practice crop rotation and plant seeds early to give them lots of time to establish themselves before the beetles become a problem. Mature plants are less susceptible to damage, so make sure to protect more vulnerable seedlings. Leaf Miners Leaf miners are small dark flies with triangular yellow markings that start out as yellow maggots. They feed on the leaves of a plant, creating irregular, round-shaped mines slash tunnels on the leaves. These mines slash tunnels are long and narrow at first, but eventually will become an irregular-shaped, light-colored patch. This damage can stump the growth of plants and cause the leaves of plants to turn yellow and drop. In extreme cases, severely infected seedlings can also die off completely. Here's what to do. Monitor plants for signs of these pests, paying close attention to the undersides of leaves. Typically, leaf miners can be removed using a stream of water in the early morning, and certain sprays are good to use too. Natural predators like ladybugs and parasitic wasps can also be attracted to keep leaf miners away. But if these pests are spotted on any plants, simply pick the bugs off and then carefully remove any damaged leaves. Insect netting can also be used to prevent leaf miners from attacking any plants. As well, keep in mind that soils should be plowed under immediately after harvest if any crops were infected with leaf miners. Crickets. Crickets aren't typically a big concern, but large swarms of them can damage an entire crop so it's always best to be cautious. Crickets feed at night and hide during the day, making it hard to identify them at first. As well, crickets will feed on plants when they're very vulnerable, which is after they've just sprouted. Here's what to do. Typically, crickets can be prevented by using drip watering instead of overhead watering. Grasshoppers. They damage plants by chewing tiny holes in their leaves. In small numbers, grasshoppers aren't an issue, and their damage can go undetected. However, their populations can explode after heavy rains and cause more serious damage to crops. Here's what to do. It's a good thing that grasshoppers aren't a huge threat, because there isn't much that can be done to prevent or get rid of them. A few things that can be tried includes keeping weeds out of the garden, covering beds with netting or cheesecloth, and attracting natural predators, like small birds. Black rot. A soil or seed-borne bacteria that causes distinct lesions to form around the outsides of leaves. These lesions turn yellow slash orange, and travel inward on the infected leaves, typically in a V shape. As well, these lesions might come together and give plants a scorched appearance. Leaf veins will then turn dark, and the stems of the plant might become discolored as well, with some dark rings on them. Leaves might wilt, dry out, and drop, and plants can eventually die. Black rot can happen at any stage of the growth process and can be spread by splashing water, equipment, wind, people, or insects. The disease typically emerges in moist, warm conditions. Here's what to do. Plant disease-free seeds or resistant varieties when possible. 
but before planting, soak the seeds in 122 degree Fahrenheit water for about 25 minutes to kill any lingering bacteria. Keep in mind that soaking seeds this way isn't 100% effective against black rot and might actually lower the seed's germination rate. As well, practice a two-year crop rotation and only use clean, sanitized tools near any crops. Wash tools with a diluted bleach mixture, about one part bleach to 10 parts water. Then rinse with cool water and towel dry after each use. It's important to control the growth of weeds and to follow the recommended plant spacing to increase airflow around plants, while also allowing plants to dry their leaves quicker. Be sure to remove and destroy any infected plants and avoid overhead watering. Downy Mildew. This fungal disease thrives in cool, humid climates. At first, downy mildew causes leaves to turn yellow, typically starting from the main vein, then spreading outward. Fungal spores that are grayish, purple, fuzzy spots will then grow on the undersides of leaves. Downy mildew typically affects young, tender leaves, and severe infections can also cause curled and distorted leaves. Sometimes those affected leaves can then become dehydrated and then drop from the plant entirely. When seedlings are affected, their growth is stunted, and downy mildew can also reduce crop yields while acting as an entry point for other diseases. When older plants are affected, in addition to the lesions they get, they will also seem more rigid and narrow as compared to healthy plants. Here's what to do. Plant resistant varieties when possible. Practice good crop rotation. Ensure good air circulation around plants and water plants early in the morning. This last tip gives the plants enough time to dry out during the day, making those plants less vulnerable to infection. Downy mildew is usually spread when leaves are wet for too long, so it also helps to avoid overhead watering. As well, be sure to keep weeds from growing. Once plants have downy mildew, the best thing to try is to eliminate moisture and humidity around the infected plants. If possible, try to improve their air circulation through selective pruning. In general, downy mildew normally clears itself up in an outdoor garden once the weather warms up, since it doesn't do well in warm temperatures. Also, if there are any infected plants, be sure to remove all crop remains after harvest to avoid reinfection since this fungus can survive in crop residue. Keep in mind too that downy mildew is much easier to control when a plant's leaves and fruit are kept protected by a copper spray. Copper treatments can begin two weeks before the disease normally appears and when a long period of wet weather is in store. Copper treatments can also start when the disease first appears. Then those treatments can be repeated at seven to 10 day intervals for as long as the treatments are needed. The harvest of arugula can start about 20 to 27 days after planting, when leaves are about four to six inches long. At this stage, the plant is actually considered baby arugula. These young leaves taste much better and they're a delicious addition to salads. Mature leaves then take about 40 to 50 days to be harvest ready. These leaves can be quite bitter and often have a less desirable texture. Mature leaves aren't great in salads, but they are great for cooking. As well, regrowth can also be harvested after the initial harvest. Arugula also produces edible flowers, which make a nice garnish or salad addition. Harvest arugula either in cool weather or in the morning. Any leaves that are harvested in the heat can get a bitter taste to them. Simply keep the harvested leaves refrigerated and enjoy.